Today is Memorial Day in the United States, so we've got a special guest to help us commemorate those who died protecting America and the free world. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kjellik. Today we sit down with two-time Purple Heart recipient Doug Greenlaw, a decorated Vietnam veteran who is commander of the Military Order of the Purple Heart. It's an organization exclusively made up of Purple Heart recipients that supports veterans and their families across America. We explore Doug's personal story, how he got his Purple Hearts, the history of the Purple Heart Medal, stories of valor, the realities of war, the draft, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. So Commander Doug Greenlaw, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thank you very much. It's particularly appropriate that you're here. It's actually our Memorial Day show today. Um, and you know you are the commander of the military order of the Purple Heart. That's correct. And uh, that's a large number of people in this country. Are well, members, there right? are 500,000 combat wounded Purple Heart recipients in America. We have about 10% uh, in the actual order itself. Uh, so it'd be about 50,000. Okay. But we were the lead advocate for, for everybody, for all of the combat wounded veterans. But I didn't want to mislead you to think that we had a 50,000, a 500,000 uh, base. Right. We don't. It's 50, but we are the lead advocate. So tell me a little bit more about the Purple Heart. That's basically anyone who's been combat wounded by the enemy receives a Purple Heart. Yes, uh, it has to be proven. Uh, there's a, uh, a release form when you leave the military called the DD Form 214. Mm -hmm. Every soldier has one. Uh, every veteran has one, and uh, if you can prove that you have a Purple Heart, you you can join. Now we so we're 100% uh, uh, full of uh, Purple Heart uh, uh, combat wounded veterans, and the Purple Heart Medal itself, which this is this is my actual my actual Purple Heart. I'm going to have to ask you about how you got that at one point. Okay, please be continue. happy to share that with yeah. you. We, we encourage uh, combat vets to talk about it. It's cathartic and it's good for them to get it out. Uh, this is a Purple Heart medal. I have, a, I have a, uh, uh, a gold leaf cluster on it, which means two. One, two. So I've got two of them. I was wounded twice in the Vietnam War in 1967, 1968. Okay. And the medal itself is the oldest medal in U.S. history. Uh, and I think it's one of the most beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful medal. Uh, people comment on it even if they don't know what it is. No. So it, it, uh, uh, it was founded by and created by General George Washington uh, in the Revolutionary War. That's how far back it goes. Okay. It started out for heroism in combat and it's evolved over the years to be uh, uh, combat wounded or killed killed or combat wounded. So nobody aspires to get a Purple Heart. You don't get up in the morning and say, boy, I hope I get a Purple Heart right. today, because you could be killed and get one too. So it's, right. and, uh, and so it's, it's a, a very serious, uh, honorable medal, beautiful medal. Uh, no one wants one, and I hope we never give out, give out another one uh, in our country's history. But history follows, you know, so it, we probably will, unfortunately. So you were, you know, you came to my attention. Actually, you were here for Fleet Week uh, uh, last week, and um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Why you were here? And yeah, Fleet Week. Uh, uh, we have a a, a, a nonprofit here called the Dol Dolphin Fund, and they uh, they had the idea of uh, supporting the Military Order of the Purple Heart by having this uh, event. It was actually yesterday, uh, as the ships turn into New York Harbor, the, sh the parade of ships. Uh, I expected a parade of ships, you know, like the elephants, one right after another. Yeah. But they, I didn't realize these big ships need one mile between, between themselves just to give them room for, for maneuvering. Move, maneuvering or whatever yeah. they have to do, yeah. So uh, we were down there yesterday morning at, at, the po at Battery Park Point at a venue where the ships passed us by and we had uh, uh, executives from the banks around the city and, and individuals and Purple Heart recipients there. Uh, it was quite a quite an event, especially if you're a Navy veteran. They really loved it, and so we did too. And now uh, tonight, uh, I guess Jimmy Fallon is going to have uh, the whole audience packed on the Tonight Show with sailors in white. So it'll be quite quite an event. 
fantastic. And so, and I was reading that the Dolphin Fund is part of the Wealth and Values Initiative. Yes, the Wealth and Values Initiative is a, uh, a money management company. It basically manages high net worth individuals and, fa and high net worth families uh, to do something to, to take their fortunes, pivot, and do something good with it. And uh, it's a very, very solid organization, and I'm very happy to be associated with them. The Dolphin Fund is one of their non-profit non companies where they, right. they do these uh, uh, non-profit fundraisers or speaking for the non-profit world for the, the families. Well, fantastic. It's, I'm glad they were able to bring you here to New York I'm happy to, to be have here. this conversation. Happy to be here. But so tell me, how, how did you get the Purple Heart? What, what happened? Well, um, it's been a few years. It has, it has, but uh, you know, our wars never end in our heads. There's a thing called PTSD. Right. And uh, I think every combat wounded veteran ever uh, since the, since the uh, cavemen fought in the, uh, in the fields outside the cave uh, till today through Afghanistan, uh, we all have some type of PTSD. I have a very little bit. I mean, I practically nothing. I grew up in a solid family. Right. Uh, I, I was uh, raised in the, the steel mill areas uh, of East Chicago and, okay. and Gary, Indiana, where the, the steel mills line Lake Michigan. And uh, so we, uh, uh, we have a, a, a great sense for uh, the combat wounded vets and, and their needs. Uh, and my PTSD coming from that solid environment is very small. I've seen people with PTSD so intense they can't even stand up, they fall over like a, like a pillar, frozen. Uh, so, and different, you know, drugs, alcohol, I mean, you can get into a lot of things with PTSD, this PTSD cause. So we are out, our, our organization, the Military Order of the Purple Heart, we are all out into the, uh, every state in the union with service officers and local chapters where the rubber meets the road. Okay. And uh, the service officers deal directly with the, uh, with the vets in many, any way that they, they f have need. For instance, if they need help in, uh, with the, uh, venturing into the bureaucracy of the VA, uh, our people know exactly how to do that smoothly. Uh, we have the highest percentage of return rate uh, of any of the other service organizations. 90% uh, of the cases we take, we solve and okay. return, return benefits to that individual. The others average about 60%. Now, maybe we're a little easier, I don't know, because we're, we're combat wounded and we do get a little more attention. So uh, that's, that's what we do. So, so, that's, so that's the purpose of the, you know, yes. you said you have about one-tenth of the combat wounded. Ten percent. In, in, Ten percent. Right. 500,000, we've got about 50. Right. So we're, we're a smaller organization. We're not as big, but we're 100% uh, combat wounded vets with Purple Heart recipients. So we, we carry extra weight and on, in legislative issues and, and on the Hill in, in D.C. And, uh, and in the hearts and souls of Americans, everybody... My uncle has a Purple Heart. My grandfather has one. You know, my son just got back from Afghanistan. He has a Purple Heart. So we're, we're loved by uh, the far left. We're loved by the far right. Everybody loves the combat vets, maybe for different reasons. You know, the far left considers us victims of the, uh, the war machine, but we're not accountable for war. We, we were just the ones that are fighting. The far right thinks we're warriors, you know, go. So, but it, so in reality, we're all somewhere in between. And, and you exist, and I don't know, I don't know if all fifty thousand members work for this purpose, but basically to support the rest, right? Yes, and and there is a, a true blood brotherhood here. It's real. It's as real as PTSD. If I meet a combat wounded vet in the airport in Los Angeles, within thirty seconds. And, and we don't normally wear the metal, but there's a little lapel pin, you can, a purple lapel pin, tiny bar you right. can wear in your uh, lapel. Uh, if I spot one of those, I'll walk right over to them. And, and they do the same with me. And, and there's an instant bond. So we have a strong bond among our, ourselves and, uh, and with each other. So, Do you feel, you know, there's only some small percentage of people that have actually been, that even know people uh, directly in their families and so forth uh, that have 
been in combat or even been in the military. Do you feel there's some kind of a disconnect with the rest of the country at all? People uh, not understanding. Yeah, there is. It's it's more of a, uh, I wouldn't say a moral disconnect. Uh, like I said, everybody loves. How could you not like a guy that got wounded or a woman that got wounded? Women get wounded too. Uh, uh, so it's not a, it's not a moral issue. It's more of just an informational issue. They don't know what it really means and what happened, and it, there's sort of a big curiosity factor there. And so we encourage our veterans to talk about their wounds, uh, not necessarily graphically, depending on who you're talking to. If you and I are having a beer or something, uh, we'll I might get a little more graphic just to explain it to you. But if, in a general situation like today, or or when I'm giving a speech. I, I evaluate the audience and I, I sort of adjust to that because uh, it's extremely graphic <laughs> when, when you, uh, if you, you can, I can get as graphic as anybody wants to hear. So, but I, I tend to uh, sort of clean it up a little bit when I'm talking about general, general wounds because some of, the, some of these wounds are, are very traumatic. Uh, you, you, you read in the New York Times, Afghanistan, there's a roadside bomb. Sure. Um, three were, were killed and 14 wounded. Well, you say, well, you know, it's too bad for the three, but at least 14 lived and 14 are fine. Well, they're not fine. <laughs> they're not fine at all. Some of them face the worst lives you can imagine. With their, you know, their faces uh, burned off from the explosion right. and uh, missing arms and legs, uh, but they're still alive and they're thankful for that. Sure. Their families are too, but still, it's not much. Sometimes it's not much of a life. It's a, it's a, it's a life, but it's a different life. From one second to the next, it changes. You know, 180 degrees. So uh, it's it's uh, it's a, it's something we deal with on a daily basis. Wow. So do tell me about your particular story of the Purple Heart, but let's do the sort of in, in, intermediate version, you know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. I will do that. Uh, mine can, my first wound cannot be graphic. I mean, it was, uh, I was a plat uh, infantry platoon leader, yeah. first lieutenant, had 50 men in my platoon, and uh, we ran a, a good platoon. And uh, I used to uh, go out with my men, uh, and uh, I wouldn't ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do or haven't done. We'd go, I'd go out on patrols with them or ambushes or whatever we decided to do there, or whatever right. I decided to do that night, always at night. Uh, we, but during the day, we patrolled as a platoon. At night, we would send out uh, you know, squads or, or teams. So um, we, uh, we had a, a situation uh, where uh, we flew around in helicopters, so we'd do combat assaults in helicopters. Instead okay. of airborne, we were just in these helicopters. You can't, you can't jump into the jungle. Right. So we would fly in, and my platoon was the first platoon uh, in the lead, and my job was with our platoon to secure the area for the other helicopters to come in, and we would pop green smoke if it was secure and safe. We'd pop red smoke if it wasn't secure. Well, they made a mistake, the helicopter pilots, and they, they, we had seven helicopters carrying my platoon, about f you know, five to seven combat guys in each helicopter. Flew in, they made a mistake and landed us about a thousand yards farther than they were supposed to. Okay. They landed us in the middle of a North Vietnamese battalion of about 400. So we were immediately target practice and uh, okay. overrun uh, by uh, North Vietnamese regular troops, which are not Viet Cong. Viet Cong are the little farmers that go out at night and set booby traps or whatever. This was a, an organized fighting force. Mm -hmm. So it took them five hours to get to us. So we had to survive for five hours. And, and uh, my platoon, uh, just, I think it just, I don't remember exactly how many were wounded, but just about everybody was killed or wounded when getting off the helicopters. And I jumped off and immediately was shot in the leg. Now it wasn't a serious wound. I mean, it, I felt it, at the time I thought it was serious. It turned out to be not so serious, but it was behind my, behind my leg in the, uh, the hamstring area. And uh, so we fought uh, for five hours and I f ended up bringing in uh, F-4 jets uh, Phantom jets in to drop bombs on our own position, which drove them away. And as they drove away, uh, w another round of napalm came in. It was it was very ugly. Just completely yeah. difficult to imagine for someone that hasn't <laughs> yeah. faced something. Like and I that. was the old man. I was twenty three. Well, I, I was twenty two at that time. The old man old at twenty two. <laughs> old man at twenty two. So that was my first wound, and and uh, I went back to the rear area. Uh, 
and had uh, some minor surgery and, and fixed my leg, and it, it healed in country. So uh, when it healed, um, they, I got a brigade level promotion uh, in that first effort. I got a silver star and, uh, and a purple heart, and then uh, I got a brigade level promotion to company commander. So there I was, uh, a 23 year old, now I had a, year, I had a birthday, 23 year old infantry company commander commanding 158 men and responsible for their, wi their wives, for their lives. And uh, it was a, a transformational experience. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> but we learned fast. We ended up having a good company. And uh, I, again, like I did as a platoon leader, I would go out on occasion on a, uh, a, a you know, on an ambush or a, or a patrol. And uh, I went out on a patrol one night and we were in a, uh, uh, a bamboo forest. And I didn't realize that, you know, bamboo trees get this big around. Right. Uh, you know, ancient forests. We're used to the fishing pole bamboos. Right. <laughs> so uh, there was a, uh, a, an artillery shell um, booby trapped with a trip wire. And, uh, and it was about head high and it tripped it. And, uh, three in front of me were killed and one behind me and I was wounded in the neck, the face, uh, compound fracture of my right leg, lost my left kneecap, and I had a, uh, a piece of bamboo that nailed my left arm to my chest. I was a mess. They, they, they stopped the bleeding in my neck. My, this, when, when people die on the battlefield, they usually don't get shot and dead. They, they bleed out. They hit an just, artery or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they just bleed out, or even internally, they'll bleed out, and uh, you, can't, you can't save them fast enough. Uh, they actually got a good grip on my veins and arteries in my neck and, and kept me alive on the helicopter. It ha just happened to be a resupply helicopter coming in that evening. They threw me on the helicopter, sent me to a mass unit where they gave me the last rites. I wasn't going to make it. So this Catholic priest gave me the last rites. Unbelievable. A and uh, the ironic thing is, this is, a, this is an interesting thing, uh, uh, my officer candidate school, OCS, mm -hmm. roommate, walked into the smash tent to uh, identify some bodies. He walked over to me, it's a guy I knew intimately well, right. a great guy. Looked right at me, he said, boy, what happened to this guy? So he didn't even, rec tell. he didn't even, rec it was all, you know, it was all messy. So uh, that was, that, that uh, retired me from, not only from Vietnam, but the Army. So they sent me to Yokohama, Japan, for plastic surgery on the face okay. and the neck. And yeah, uh, fantastic job. Well, they I would give have you a book. Guessed. You can pick who do you want. You want yeah. Rock Hudson? You want Rock? No, <laughs> not really. But they just they, they do amazing jobs. Mm -hmm. And a, a general uh, in the in the military uh, operated on me, and he uh, uh, he was doing some experimental things. You know, they learn a lot in wartime. Sure. Uh, they learn a lot about how to how to yeah, all these comp put things back together. Complex and, yeah. cases they faced. You know. So uh, they gave me the last rites, and then finally, uh, this young doctor, about my age, he, I thought, he, he said, you know, I think this guy's gonna make it. And that was nice to hear, because I was totally aware of what was going on, although they didn't know it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to laugh at or cry when you uh, hear this kind a, of thing, you right? Laugh, laugh, yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, you, you know, it's almost like a dream, but uh, except it was actually me. So they, they took me uh, to the hospital, and they, they, the MASH unit, just sort of ties you up and stops the bleeding. Put me on another, another helicopter to, uh, uh, to a hospital in Da Nang, a, a fairly good sized military hospital where they, they did some, uh, they, fixed, they fixed my leg, reset my leg, uh, they found my kneecap, they, put, they reattached that and, and sort of put me together in a, in a better sense. Right. And they crated me up just like you would a, a, you know, a FedEx. <laughs> And they sent me to Yokohama, Japan, where I had uh, additional plastic surgery and uh, rehabilitation, and and uh, I, and I recovered there. And then the, the last uh, three months, they uh, they asked where you're from, and I said I'm from the Chicago area. So they sent me to Sheridan, uh, Fort Sheridan Hospital in the Chicago area, so I could be near my family to recuperate and finish my uh, uh, rehabilitation. So that's it, and uh, 
and I've uh, I've been happy and healthy ever since. I work out five days a week. Um, I'm uh, in good shape. I'm happy, and I'm doing the right thing with the military order of the Purple Heart. Well, so and so how so how is it that you ended up uh, working with this group? Well, uh, I was inter introduced to it in 1996. It was uh, the military order was was founded by Congress, actually chartered by Congress in right. 1932. To, uh, to give recognition to World War I veterans. Uh, and then it, it evolved over the years to, uh, to be for, you know, for combat wounded. And I think, right. I think FDR came up with this modern design so uh, for World War II. Um, and uh, I was introduced by the order by uh, Senator Bob Dole, uh, who I helped uh, during his, I didn't help very well, did I, during his election run in 1996. Uh, he didn't win. But uh, he introduced me to the order. So I, one day I was around him and I had my lapel pin in, not this, but the lapel pin. And he said, hey, you a Purple Heart recipient? I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, you should join the military order of the Purple Heart. And I said, what's that? And he explained it to me and I joined. And uh, I've been there with, together with them since 96. Uh, I, I founded a chapter, at the cha so I know all about the chapter level where it's really important. And then I ran for state, uh, state commander of South Carolina and got elected to that and served my term there. And then uh, I, uh, I ran for national commander last year in 18 and won. So my tour, it's only a one year tour. Uh, it's, it'll be up uh, this July. Oh, it's, an ele it's an elected position. It's it very interesting. The body of the order yeah. elects, uh, caucuses, it's like real politics. You know, you caucus, you vote. You, and uh, so, uh, but we don't get nasty like uh, they do in real, in, you know, okay. Washington, D.C. Uh, we just talk about our ethics and our, our ability to do the job, and they, they, hopefully they pick the right guy every time, every year. So, Doug, you were mentioning how uh, a big part of what the Military Order of the Purple Heart does is uh, work with the VA. Um, and so, you know, we've known for years the VA was in big need of reform. Uh, veterans weren't getting the service they needed. How are things today? I'm not an expert on the VA, mm -hmm. but I do know it from the grassroots level. Right. Uh, the vets get excellent treatment, excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm from, I, my residence is in the, the northern part of uh, South Carolina, right. called the upstate. We have a brand new 78,000 square foot uh, clinic there that covers everything, audiology to pharmacy to, uh, you know, they assign you a doctor and they're easy to get to, uh, very responsive uh, and do excellent work. And it doesn't cost the vet a penny and they, they run 850 to 900 veterans a day through that clinic. Wow, that's They crank them in, yeah. And uh, ev every age you can imagine from Afghan vets to uh, Korea vets, there aren't many uh, World War II vets left. So I think uh, it's sort of like the military order of the Purple Heart. You can find problems with the leadership and the politics and all that. When you get down to our service officer programs, it's re really well run. And uh, it's the same with the VA, in my opinion. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience. Charles Eggleston does, a fellow we're going to talk about in a minute. He, right. he, uh, he's got a lot of experience with the VA hospital system, and they've treated him fine. Uh, I will say combat wounded vets Purple Heart recipients get a little uh, special attention. I don't know that we should, but we do. Okay. And so maybe I'm a little prejudiced, but, and, and I'm sure a big organization like that has many problems they deal with on a daily basis. Uh, but I'd say that overall, they're doing a pretty doggone good job. That's what I would say. So Doug, you mentioned uh, PTSD and how basically anyone wounded in combat may, will suffer some element of it, uh, maybe a light or to, yes. to extremely heavy. Um, what, are, what, are, what are some cases that, you, that you're aware um, of? That, what well, let's of, take my case right. to start with. Very small uh, part of me is, is PTSD. I might have a sweaty dream once in a while. I don't have any flashbacks. I don't have any nerve issues. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Uh, I might have a, a, a beer with you or something. That's about all I do. 
and I'll nurse the same beer all night. So I, I don't have any bad habits. Uh, I work out, everything is, so I, I, I'm, I would be on one end of the extreme, okay? I'm the one that you would never even know I had anything. My wife knows because I, I sweat <laughs> in the bed right. and it's, it, it's uh, uncomfortable for her and me, but uh, that's very rare. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have people that uh, have, you know, alcohol problems, drug problems, um, severe uh, mental issues, and sometimes uh, traumatic brain injury, TBI. Right. Uh, and you combine all of this, and they just have a hard time with life. Um, be, I'll tell you why. In my, this is my opinion, that we were all so young. I was the old man at 23. I mean, literally the old man. I wrote letters for people, you know, to send home. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example. I know, and it's not just Vietnam. I know a man from, uh, it was in the Korean War. Okay. Uh, he was wounded and the Chinese captured him. And as they were dragging them back to their camp, they said, when we get there, we're gonna interrogate you and we're going to get all the information we can get and then we're going to kill you. Well, he thought to himself, if uh, they're going to kill me, they're going to, ki they're going to kill me uh, escaping. So sure enough, that night, in the middle of the night, he had two guards on him. He's a big, strong kid from Alabama. Uh, he killed both of the guards and he escaped, wounded. He escaped, weakened, found his way back somehow to his unit and the shocking thing is he just had just turned 18 years old, right out of high school. <laughs> so, and that's a Korean War. Uh, I spoke to a, I have a trivia uh, winner for you. You're not a betting person, I bet. No, I'm not, but. I, I'm not either, but this is a, a cute betting. If you want to bet someone, a, a gentleman's bet, ask them how long it took uh, on the storming of Normandy how long did it get from the beach? I'm going to ask you this question. How long do you think it took from the beach, when they hit the beach, to go up the beach and up the cliff to the top of the cliff? How long, of a, how long do you think that took? What, under fire and uh, everything? Oh, yeah, well, uh, total under fire, 100% fire. Oh, my gosh, I can't even imagine you know, a really, mortars, really long time. Machine guns, they had machine guns. They had these big cement uh, billets up there with machine guns in it. Uh, how long do you think it took? Take a guess. I don't know. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> Take a guess. A wild guess. Well, okay, a day. A day? Yeah. 20 minutes. 20 minutes? 20 minutes. You know why? Why? Because they were 19 years old, 18, 17. A lot of them lied to get in. It's 16. The y youngest they had was 13. Here's what happened. They hit the beach. They're 19 years old. They run like crazy. There's a gallon of uh, adrenaline pouring directly on their heart. Uh, so they, they flew to the up the beach. When they hit the ground, I, I, and I got this from a, a vet that did it. Okay. So this is a first-hand account. Because I, I, I meet him from all wars. He, uh, he raced across the beach. His friends were falling all around him. And they started off with 173 uh, men from their company hit the beach at once. They got to the cliff with 70. So they lost 100 on, on the beach. From, from, they had 70 at the base of the cliff. They got to the top of the cliff with 12. He was one of the 12 that made it to the top. And they held the ground there until more could come behind them. This is, so, you know, this is just so hard to imagine, actually. You know, it just goes to show someone who hasn't been in combat or anywhere close to it, doesn't have an idea of the reality. No, adrenaline plays a big part. Yeah. Uh, in, in Vietnam, we would be trudging across a uh, rice paddy sinking up to your shins and slogging and one foot out, you know, another foot out and just could, couldn't bear, could barely move, right? The first, the first uh, sniper shot that comes through, they ran like Carl Lewis, you know, to uh, like a sprinter, a world-class sprinter to get out of that rice paddy because of the adrenaline and, and, and you get to the other side and it's, it's, like, uh, it's like there was no mud at all. Their complaining turned into, <laughs> you know, adrenaline rage to right. get to the other side. Some of these rice paddies are, you know, half a mile square. You know, they're huge. Right. And you get in the middle of one, that's when the snipers start shooting. So, uh, again, it's this youth factor. Um, you don't see 
40-year-old Harvard MBAs out there fighting wars or MIT uh, PhD grads. No, you see 18, 19-year-old warriors right out of high school. And, and the leaders are uh, second and first lieutenants. I was a first lieutenant and, uh, and we were just a couple of years older. You know, I was, like I said, I was 23. And so ask any vet you see, an older vet, somebody my age, or if you can get a Korean vet, how old were you when you fought? And he'll say 18, 19, 17, or I lied to get in, so I was 16. <laughs> so uh, that's who fights the wars. And the reason is that they're, uh, they're supermen. They think uh, the bullets are going to glance right off of them. And they don't they think everybody here can be killed, including me. Everybody here is going to get killed. I'll make it. That's just human nature. So you combine the youth with the, plus being big and strong. We were all strong as oxes in those days. And uh, that's just the way it is. We're Americans. We're big, tough people. And made by uh, the Poles and the, the Jews and uh, the, the, the Europeans that came here, the Italians, the Irish. That's who we are, and so we have a tough group to begin with. Nobody's tougher than the Poles. I'm from Chicago area. They've got more Poles in Chicago than they do in uh, the country, in one of the big cities. So uh, that's oh, who and, we are. And, and the African Americans, gosh, right? The African Americans, absolutely. There's no racism yeah. in war. If the if the percentage of uh, African Americans in America I hear is like 12 percent, something like that. In the military, it's more like 25 or even, you know, be 25, between 25 and 30 percent. Right. So we had a lot of uh, our, our black brothers we were fighting with, and there was no racism. We'd huddle up at night, and we'd take our, you and I, would take our uh, a poncho, a rubber poncho, during a monsoon rainstorm. We'd get together under the poncho so we could warm it up, because anything under 80 degrees is cold at night when you're soaking wet. Right. And we'd huddle together. I didn't care who it was, and neither did he. So uh, it's a it's a brotherhood, it really is. So it's any uh, young young people. You know, something that just struck me is that the uh, you know the opioid crisis here has been wreaking havoc amidst right. the civilian population. But it's, when I'm hearing about uh, a lot of folks suffering from PTSD at different levels, I'd imagine it's a it's a significant issue. In it the, is. The it's easy to get, well. and a lot of times it was started in uh, Vietnam it, during my era right. because there was a lot of uh, marijuana over there. They they would, uh, but they would lace it with heroin. Oh. So guys would get addicted without even right. knowing it. I see. And so, uh, unfortunately, I didn't touch any of that stuff, and none of my men did either. I made sure that happened. It didn't happen, but. Uh, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the low-level leaders, you know, the sergeants and the lieutenants and the captains that are down on the ground that make it safer for the, for the soldiers, because that's our job, is to save their lives, win and save their lives. And so we, uh, we were very con uh, conscious of that. But other loose leadership, I was on my people every day. Clean your, clean your rifle, because if it doesn't go off, you're going to be killed. I had them clean their rifle every day. I had them keep clean. We took, we'd get a stream, we'd put guards up, we'd take baths in a stream, stay clean, uh, clean your uniform. And uh, first thing you do is get rid of your underwear and your socks, because <laughs> they, they go bad right away. Get rid of them, you don't need them. Your feet get strong and tough and, uh, and need discipline. And so when you come out of that situation, if you ever want to hire a good solid person, hire a vet. They come to you disciplined, they show up on time, they work hard, they're good under adversarial circumstances, uh, and they'll defend the place if they need to. So uh, we're a good bet, and, and that's, that's why we're uh, as popular as we are at the, at the combat wounded vet uh, version of us, is that uh, you know, we get things done and we, we try to do the right thing. We've seen, we've seen the ugly part, you know, the, they stared death down or we wouldn't be here. So we were talking about your friend Charles, who you met. Yeah, That's Charles Eggleston. Your, Charles he's, Eggleston. A, he's a very good friend of mine. Exactly. And uh, he's an African American and he is uh, a piece of work. I love him. He's a great guy. And uh, he was wounded 
gravely. When I remember I said I, I thought I had it bad. Charles was uh, a, a, a special ops team leader, and uh, he was attacked in Iraq by uh, gunfire and uh, also by uh, mortar and rocket attacks. And they all they were, they were moving forward, and they, they, he was attacked from behind. Every, he was the only survivor of his team. They were all killed, and he was almost killed. He was very very lucky to be alive. He was wounded so seriously that uh, they were taking human bones out of his back from his men behind him. Wow. Today, unimaginable. Today, mm -hmm. he walks around with shards of bone from others inside of his body. Now, you, you try to try to say he does not have PTSD. He does, but boy, he controls it. He's he's a solid citizen. He 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 uh, he's a great person, and he went to uh, they they like they did me they put him back together and then shipped him they actually crated me in a in a in a cast uh -huh. i came back crated so i couldn't move around and he the same they would they crate you up in a body cast okay. and send you back to the u.s for surgery he had 60 surgeries i think 61 he had 60 surgeries and uh and uh, his face his head steel titanium down both sides uh and uh, he's alive and well today. And you look at him, he's handsome. All of our scars are underneath. I've got some here, but you can't really notice them with plastic surgery. And uh, you never know there's anything wrong with him. But uh, the truth comes out. Charles was hit very, very hard. He was in Walter Reed Hospital for three and a half years. And years. he's now working with you? Yes, he's our, he's the region, we have six big regions across the country, mm -hmm. the order does. And region one is the east coast. Region six is the west coast, and you've got to divvy it up along the way. He's commander of region one, and he's a good, strong uh, commander. I'm very lucky to have him. Fantastic. I know a man in Atlanta woke up in a zipped up body bag in the cooler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, and he's semi-normal. Something from the movies. Yeah, yeah he, uh, uh, and he, he had a religious experience in the bag. He woke up and he said, God visited me in that bag. And I said, really? He said, yes. And uh, he, he said, God told me that uh, Jesus never died. Jesus woke up in that tomb, just like I did, showed everybody his wounds, uh, married Mary Magladen, had kids, lived a life. And uh, my pastor tells me it's, it's called the swoon theory. It's fairly common. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a theory to this guy in the bag. Right. <laughs> I asked him, what's God look like? And he said, uh, he, I don't think he'd ever been asked that question because he was in the bag with you, right? Yeah, he was. But I said, what did he look like? I, I sort of like Tom Hanks, I think. <laughs> he did. He said, I think awesome. he looks sort of like Tom Hanks. Well, whether it's a dream or out of body experience or it really happened, who am I to judge? Right? So I just took it as it was. That's it's his belief. Maybe it's PTSD. I don't know. Maybe it actually happened. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> so there I am. So I've got stories like that that go on and on and on. And uh, stories like. Uh, uh, Tom or uh, John Kerry, Senator John Kerry, mm -hmm. the former uh, Secretary of State. You know, he faked a Purple Heart. John, if you're watching this, I'm going to say it. He faked his first Purple Heart. He, he uh, if you shoot yourself in the foot, you don't get a paper, uh, Purple Heart. If okay. somebody else shoots you in the foot, you get a Purple Heart. Well, he shot an M79 grenade launcher. It's like a big shotgun. You put a grenade, a big bullet in the back, snap it shut. He shot it against, I guess, a, a, a rock. Uh, he's a, he was a riverboat captain. A rock along the river, and it blew the rock up, and a piece of uh, granite or whatever the rock was stuck in his arm about the size of a, of a grain of sand. He pinched it out and applied for a Purple Heart and didn't get it. And he reapplied through his battalion commander and got his Purple Heart. So, And I, I looked him up on the Internet, and... Uh, uh, I couldn't find anything about, he got three Purple Hearts. I couldn't find anything about his other two Purple Hearts. Now maybe they were real, I don't know. But, so you have one extreme, 
pinch the grain of sand out. And then the other extreme is Charles Eggleston, who <laughs> gets blown to bits. And uh, so that's, that's the story of the Purple Heart. So, you know, something, another thing just struck me. Um, you know, the vast majority of the population of this country has not experienced combat. Right. It's not been in a military setting. But there's other places, say Israel, you know, where everybody has. There's, there's just a mandatory draft. Everyone has to serve their serve few years. Um, is, do you think that's something that would help in America for people to understand the realities? Yeah, I'm to, not to, sure. to have a draft? Oh, a draft? Yeah. Uh, yes, I actually do. I do. I think that uh, I think the draft is a good thing. Uh, the volunteer military is uh, is suffering right now because uh, people don't want to join. So now they are offering benefits to join. For instance, if you're a high school senior, at least in South Carolina, and I know many states are like this, in South Carolina, if you're a, a high school senior, junior going into your senior year, if you sign up for one of the militaries, any of them, you will get a signing bonus. No, in your first senior year, you'll get $500 a month, your, your whole senior year. That's a lot of money for a high school kid. You it know? is. <laughs> Certainly would have been for me. Oh, me too. Yeah. So you get, now you don't get the money until you, you join and, and go through basic training and you're in, but then you get the check. And uh, once you sign up, after you graduate and you literally sign the documents and give the, you know, the honor code, uh, you get a check from between, some, depending on your MOS and other your, your job, whatever your job is, mm -hmm. some pay more than others, they will give you a signing bonus for $20,000 to $40,000 for a kid right out of high school. Because they're trying to compete with Google and Amazon and you know, all the, sure. the, the jobs out there. Sure. Or going to college or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's a it's a competitive environment. So I, I think the draft is a good idea because, you know, in World War II, not so much Vietnam, but World War II, the Rockefellers were in there. You know, you'd see uh, you'd see you'd be next to the senator's son. You know, and maybe they could pull a few strings, but you still were in. Uh, you know, good Al Gore is a good example. Al Gore, everybody complains about him. Ah, oh, he went to Vietnam, but he was a photographer. He was a journalist. He really wasn't in the. Hey, tell you what, you put your foot down on the ground in Vietnam, you got my respect, because <laughs> you could get killed. And, uh, and and it's Al Gore. You know, I think he draft was drafted. I think. So it's it's a. Uh, excuse me, my hearing hearing isn't what it used to be. Uh, but so, yeah, I think, that, I think the draft is a good idea. I really do. Let everybody go. So, you know, today uh, it's Memorial Day. Um, it's our Memorial Day show. Do you have anything you'd like to share with uh, the American people and, and maybe internationally on Memorial Day? Memorial Day is a special day. It really is. We're memorializing those that were killed in combat. And God bless them. You know, a lot of them had Purple Hearts maybe most of them, depending on how they were killed. So, uh, yeah, I'm all for memorializing our, our dead from World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, you know, uh, the Gulf War, Afghanistan, Iraq. We all deserve respect for those that were killed. And uh, so I have, a, I have a full day planned on Monday, to, on this, today on this uh, Memorial Day, to uh, to pay my respects in, in Washington, D.C., and it's well-deserved. It's an honor to have them, you know, in our, our history. So you, were, you just mentioned how um, people aren't so interested in joining the military, or maybe less interested. How, how does patriotism fit into this? So that's what struck me. Well, uh, I'm not saying that people that don't want to be in the military, first of all, they're not all needed. You know, uh, like Vietnam, you know, some of my best friends didn't go. Well, that's fine. Uh, can't, we didn't need every person over there. We'd have, you know, 25 million soldiers. We don't need that many. Right. Uh, so I have, I, I think they're the vast majority of Americans on both sides, the liberals, the, the conservatives, those of us in the middle, um, are patriots. They love this country. If you travel at all, which I know you probably have, mm -hmm. you realize what a great country this is. Uh, 
the developed countries uh, aren't America. Uh, I've been around the world. I've been to China. I've been to Russia. I've been all over Europe. I've climbed mountains in, in uh, South America. And I've seen many, many countries, many, probably more than most. None of them are like America. And that's why people want to come to America. You can, you can uh, come here with nothing. And uh, I know you're, you're from an immigrant family. I'm sure they started out at the bottom and worked their way up to the top. And I'm proud of you for that. And that, that's what American is all about. It's, it's, uh, you don't have to be a veteran. You don't have to be a combat wounded veteran. Uh, you just have to be an American, I think, to understand that. I'm a uh, high altitude uh, mountain climber. Oh. I climbed uh, Kilimanjaro and Aconcagua in Argentina. I've been in Russia uh, backpacking uh, uh, China. Uh, I backpacked uh, the Great Wall. I've been all over Europe. I've been everywhere. Still do that? Including, yeah, I do. I'm oh, climbing, I have to climbing go with Mount you Everest uh, next uh, <laughs> oh, spring. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I've seen it all, and I can say for a fact there's no country like America. Yeah, well, wonderful. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. My honor. Glad to be here.